With the arrival the other year of BMW's R18 Cruiser, which is equipped with the firm's biggest ever air-cooled boxer engine, it reminded us of the German Mark's previous very disastrous attempt at a cruiser. And that was, of course, the 1997 R1200C. And then that got us thinking of other motorcycling flops from the past. And while that's a subject that bike manufacturers might not like to be reminded of, Recent history is in fact littered with great white motorcycling hopes that pioneered new styles or technologies, yet which actually turned out to be unmitigated motorcycling disasters. So here in chronological order are the top 10 motorcycling flops and the hope that no more arrive in years to come. We're starting this list with the GTS 1000 from Yamaha. Hugely ambitious, pioneering and with massive expectation on its shoulders. It was designed at vast cost and the headline grabbing front end was joined by pioneering fuel injection, ABS and a catalytic converter. It even had six piston brake calipers and much, much more. The good news was it was actually very good. The bad news was it was just too easy to criticize. While the engine was developed from that of the 140 bhp FZR1000, it was retuned to produce just 100 horsepower. The Omega chassis concept, albeit clever, was heavy and unwieldy, especially at low speed. Fuel consumption was poor and the tank range was small. And worst of all, to top it all off, the GTS was just too expensive. As a result, potential buyers simply weren't prepared to pay over the odds for radical tech when they could have the proven shaft-driven Honda ST1100 Pan-European for significantly less money. We mentioned the R18 at the top, so we had to include the R1200C on this list. Originally launched in 1997, the C was BMW's attempt to tap into the vast, highly dominated US cruiser market. Unfortunately, it chose to do it with only a mild variation of its then R1150 Boxer and gave it half-baked styling that really only its mother could love. Both of these factors go some way to explaining the huge technological and styling efforts which have gone into the new R18. Beamer really didn't want to make the same mistake again with this one. Although it is enlarged to 1170cc and retuned for torque, the resulting lump produced just 61 bhp. And unfortunately, none of that really washed with the Harley Brigade across the pond. It did just look hideous. Even James Bond failed to make it look cool in 1997's Tomorrow Never Dies, and despite numerous spin-off models, it never caught on, being dropped by BMW from the range in 2004. It's no wonder it took the German Mark 15 years to attempt a cruiser again. Okay, so maybe it's a little bit harsh to call Suzuki's TL a flop. After all, initially, this Japanese Ducati outsold the 916. Its punchy engine was always considered one of the very best V-twins, living on to this day in the V-Strom 1050. Now though, both the S and the R versions of the TL are considered affordable classics, with prices likely set to rise. But that all ignores the fact that at the launch of the bike, the initial S was so blighted by its revolutionary rotary damper rear suspension and ultra-sharp geometry, it became considered a widow-maker, forcing Suzuki to retrofit a steering damper. On top of that, the later Suzuki TL1000R, the sports bike brother of the TL1000S, was intended for World Superbike. Although it proved so overweight, so unwieldy and unreliable, it was quickly abandoned. Both TLs may be thought of as classics today, but at the time they were corporate embarrassments so big that they were killed off by 2002. Another short-lived V-twin, although this one from Aprilia in the form of the Futura RST1000 Sports Tourer. It was originally conceived to rival Honda's VFR800 V4 Sports Tourer and used a detuned 100bhp version of the Rotax V-twin from the original RSV Milli. It had a similar single-sided swing arm and underseat exhaust, an equally late 80s early 90s dash comfy ergonomics and fancy angular bodywork. On paper, it should have been quite good. Unfortunately, the looks were divisive. Some thought it was too bulky and the lumpy V-twin delivery clashed with its high-tech looks. Production problems delayed deliveries and it was also quite expensive for what it was. 
Besides, most potential buyers were far more likely to visit a Honda dealer than try and find an Aprilia one that was near them. Speaking of classics, we couldn't attempt any rundown of motorcycling flops without the inclusion of one of the most notorious of all. However revered the bikes concerned are today, we are talking of course about Ducati's infamous retros before their time, Sport Classic family. Launched in 2005 as a duo, the Sport 1000 and Paul Smart LE were joined by the GT1000 in 2007. All were beautifully styled, retro-inspired and powered by 1000DS 90bhp air-cooled V-twins, and they were festooned with quality details and cycle parts. Today we'd lap them up, in fact we do, good used examples now regularly fetch well into five figures. At the time though, they were mere single-seaters, the Sport was cramped and the LE was too expensive. Besides, retros back then hadn't really taken off. Ducati tried to fix things with new bars and a Paposto and cheaper versions, but they were too late and the range was killed off in 2010. All of which, considering today's scrambler offerings and the popularity that they've gained, is a huge shame and explains why good use examples now fetch big money. This is proof, if ever it was needed, that manufacturers should never get swept up in motorcycle show excitement. The original B-King was an insanely wild concept bike that was unveiled at the Tokyo show in 2001. Basically, it was a stripped-down roadster version of the Hayabusa Hyperbike. It grabbed attention by also having a supercharger, a massive back tyre and styling that was straight out of Judge Dredd. Build it, everybody said, and we will buy it, they promised. So Suzuki did. Unfortunately, however, by the time it was ready, practical concerns meant there was no supercharger the styling had been watered down, and it still costs almost twice as much as a conventional Super Naked. In its defence, the Beaking was still a wild ride, was an early adopter of riding modes, and it was well built and equipped. But it was expensive. Crucially, it didn't have that supercharger, which was the original selling point of the bike. Another bold concept that made it into production but probably shouldn't have is the XR1200. It was a Harley Europe-driven concept and it was aimed at boosting Harley sales on this side of the pond by being a Ducati Monster-styled performance naked, but with the styling inspired by Harley's heritage in US flat tracking. The reworked Sportster V-Twin produced an adequate 90 bhp. The chassis was impressively nimble, for a Harley anyway, and it looked good too. The trouble was it was quite heavy and had no performance advantage over the competition either. It's a shame really, Harley did try to improve the model by launching a one-make race series here in the UK and Europe, although it was simply too little too late and the XR was killed off in 2012. You've gotta love Honda. While Big Red may have the reputation of being overly conservative and pretty uncool, it's also undeniable that it pushes the boat out every now and again. One of the most recent and bonkers has to be the DN01 of 2008, a sort of high-tech custom cruiser. The DN01 had a bit of everything, and it combined it into a real dog's dinner of a motorcycle. The 680cc V-twin engine is from the uninspiring DeVille Tourer and was blended with an early form of Honda's semi-automatic gearbox. It was so bland and characterless, straight out of the box. The feet forward riding position and kicked out forks are cruiser, so yeah, it's comfy, although ground clearance really was an issue. Its styling is also so sharp and its screen is so useless for commuting or any distance work and its lavish technology and dashboard made it expensive as well. So it's slow, it's unconventional, not sporty, not Tory and not even cheap. I'll have three, said no one ever. The Street 750 was Harley's last attempt at making a true starter bike. It looked okay on paper, although on the road its performance would have quickly become tiresome to all but the most timid of new riders. Sure, it was a cheap route into Harley-Davidson ownership at just 5,795 quid. The trouble was, not many young, impressionable new riders were walking into Harley-Davidson dealerships to buy a cruiser. The cafe racer and classic scene in the UK and Europe was just kicking off when the Street 750 came out, and not even the more muscular Street Rod launched shortly after could rescue the project.
And finally, for now, we couldn't resist including another weird and wonderful Honda in the form of the CTX 1300. Whatever way you look at the CTX, it makes very little sense. So little, in fact, that production only lasted for a single year. Basically, it's a cruiser or bagger version of the old STX 1300 Tourer. So straight away, it's hard to see the Americans going for it. And sadly, they didn't. Second, instead of a straight replacement or update for the practical pan-European, Honda gave us this low-screened, feet-forward version, which isn't going to get us continental types queuing round the block for it either. And sadly, we didn't. Thirdly, it's supposedly got style, but it's actually very bland and weirdly featured speakers, but no stereo. None of this made sense and none of it made it cheap to buy. It will be no surprise at all to hear that it bombed, with Honda pulling the plug after just one year of production of this weird and wonderful model. So there we go, that's the top 10 motorcycle flops that we can think of of the last 20 or 30 years. If we've missed out any bikes, please let us know in the comments section below. And if you've liked this video, please don't forget to hit like and subscribe so that you can stay up to date with all of Visordown's latest videos. For all the latest news, reviews and motorcycle features, head over to visordown.com.